Oh, Just hello, Burlock. <laughs> hello, Grumsworth. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well, I'm very well. How are you doing this day? Fine, yes, fine. So the world is a, a strange place, but we're all well. Good, good. Well, it's still a strange place, that's for sure. Um, we're going to have a little chat now, aren't we? About some of the things that interest us. And we're going to bring no. it to you, your fine viewers, um, in the form of this wondrous podcast. It is, the preamble. The preamble, that's right, yeah. Um, what is the preamble all about, Grumsworth? Oh, well, many, many interesting, and basically hobby-based uh, topics there. Um, we're both, uh, we're both laden down, burdened, I say, with hobbies, aren't we? We certainly Quite are, yes. Up. Many and varied, but um, predominantly wargaming, I suppose, miniature painting. That's right. A little um, bit of um, some some card game sort of situations. Yeah, yep. Some good old CCGs, uh, Magic: The Gathering. Yeah, Keyforge. Loving some of that. Yeah, there's plenty of um, plenty of hobby. But and we've, uh, we've got some computer games and stuff like that thrown in as well, haven't we? We do a yeah. bit of that from time to time. Pretty badly. Pretty badly. Currently, <laughs> for uh, for me and my video gaming is Fallout seventy six. Mm. Uh, Me also. Of, uh, a little bit of Warcraft. A little bit of Warcraft still in anticipation for the old Shadowlands that's coming soon. Yes. Um, yeah. Always Heroes of the Storm for my many sins. Always, um, always. I think most of those are quite similar for yourself, aren't they? Yeah, pretty much. The yeah, enjoying uh, Fallout seventy six at the moment. Uh, that's just recently sort of come into its own. I think as a game, uh, very strong presently. Um, yeah, a little bit of Heroes of the Storm when I can find the time to lose some rating and some ranked matches. Um, a, humble, a humble loss. Humble loss well, is always accepted. If if you can get through an evening and come out with one more win than your losses, I say that's a good evening. Otherwise, it's all over. It's bad. That's it, yeah. And so that's, I guess, the idea of what we want to be doing here with the preamble, isn't it? It's just to give um, our small and humble pearls of wisdom um, and general topics for discussion to, to everyone listening or watching. That's right. I think, um, I think it will be interesting if we can get across some sort of relatable stuff. There might even be like nuggets of helpful, dare I say, useful information for anyone who is already, you know, landlocked into the hobby for life as we are. As we most um, certainly are. As we are. Um, gleefully, I might add, um, and uh, yeah, I think I think we'll plan to discuss kind of um, uh, newly released products and things like that, as well as what we've been up to ourselves. Yeah, and this is um, episode zero, as we're calling it, isn't it? Actually, it is. because episode zero, um, and we're going to see see where it takes us, basically. So um, forgive us if we stray too far off topic. I'm sure we won't, but we may do. But that's all I the mean, part of this. Yeah. This, is, this is just a discussion, isn't it, at the end of the day? Just a conversation. It is. So. It, is. it is just a simple conversation. Um, but, I, I mean, I think, rest assured, there will be some straying going on, off yes. topic and otherwise. <laughs> Very good. Well, I mean, bringing us um, on to uh, some form of topic, what have you been working on sort of the past couple of weeks there, Grumsworth? First couple of weeks have been pretty productive, I must say. Um, trying a little bit of a uh, um, the old uh, um, paint to brush situation, trying to get uh, something painted, um, even if it's perhaps ten or fifteen minutes over the course of a, a day each and every day. Um, and as we know, we've 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 sort of indulged in this practice a little bit before but mm. for any of you that have not or, or don't know it it is basically the case that if you find yourself getting into that sort of rut where you're struggling to get your miniatures painted um, and you've got armies of grey plastic sat on in front of you on your desk leering at you with their stupid unundercoated faces um, <laughs> yeah. the idea is, is is to portion a small amount of your day a tiny amount of every day to to getting a little bit more done so whether it's putting a couple more guys together um undercoating a gang of them throwing some color down even if it's just on on small pieces just chipping away at it 
um, with the idea that that will encourage you. It's it's building up your hobby muscles, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I've engaged in in very similar things over the past few weeks as well. Um, there's been many an occasion, and I'm sure we'll dive into this in detail at some stage in the future. But times when you just lose all enthusiasm to paint, and yes. there's not a lot you can seem to be able to do to get yourself out of it. But this idea of a daily paint to brush um, is almost like a personal challenge, but it doesn't need to be that challenging. As you say, it can just be a single, a single highlight on a weapon edge or um, yeah. applying a single coat of glaze over a certain patch of the model that you're working on. Um, and that can really help to boost your own morale, isn't it? And uh, you know, that's a, that's, that's a separate topic for discussion, I think, but at the same time, it's yeah. just one of those small things you can do on a daily basis just to get you over the line, get you over that hump. And we would both really recommend that, wouldn't we? Mm. As hobby medical professionals, we oh, would yeah. recommend yeah. that. Yeah, in our, in, our, in our firm professional diagnosis, you are firmly in need of the paint to brush. Yeah, so the that's, that's, really been, that's really been uh, helping me get through these. Uh, I've got a little um, gang of the um, uh, Necromunda House Cool Door. Oh, that um, game's workshop, very good. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Really beautiful models um really superb a, a massive pain in the backside to put together i would say in as much as they are they are quite a large multi-part kit but they are essentially monopose um that there is very little you can you can change a head around here or there or there are a couple of individual guys there's 10 of them in there there's a couple of individuals that you can swap weapons out on but for the most part, there, there are a lot of effort to build something which you can't really customise unless you get into hacking apart with your tools, which bit I'm kit, very fond kit, of. A bit of kit bashing, can't, you know, is always expected with something like Necromunda, especially, isn't it? Especially given the nature very, of the game yeah, and how your yeah. gangs can gain experience and grow over time, a certain element of kit bashing is is certainly required, I think, in the long run, isn't it? But does it do the kits themselves, do they allow you the room to be able to do that? Are the weapons posed in such a way that it's an easy swap for a weapon change or a bionic limb or something like that? I, I personally think so, yeah. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is their scale. Um, the whole Necromunda range is quite uh, like true scale, actually. Uh, quite small in the hand and foot department and the face the weapons are of a reasonably realistic kind of proportion. So they kind so of cranked like, away from the hero scale that yeah. Warhammer and Warhammer yeah. 40k kind they've, of has. They've still got a shade of that about them. Um, Good, but, yeah. but yeah, ch check them out on any website under the sun, you'll find them there. And you can yeah. look at these guys. Um, but despite the fact they've been a little bit of a pain to put together, they're actually a joy to paint at the moment. They're really enjoying them. And... Good. At first, I was not thinking this would be the case in as much as they are almost entirely composed of the single thing which I detest painting. Oh, don't tell me. I know it. <laughs> robes. Robes, they're, isn't they're, it? <laughs> they're, they're made of robes. <laughs> um, but which I have in the past <laughs> had a real dislike for painting. Um, but they thematically, um, they, they are the... the they are the house from Necromunda that I cleave to most, and visually they are superb. So I, I got together in my head, I thought, okay, we're going to work out a way to paint these robes quickly, um, but with a result that I enjoy. And then we're going to work up all the other details. So, yeah. And that's been going really well. I'm really enjoying Good. them. Good. And you found that it's been, they've been coming together quite quickly. Very. That's mm. another kind of thing that I, I wanted to get them done um, to a standard that I personally was really happy with um, and make them tabletop ready, um, but also sort of basic enough that I could go in later and continue to add detail. Mm. Um, so so where, where a guy is kind of head to toe in a couple of colours of ragged robe, there's, there's plenty of room there to add... Um, uh, deeper shadows, brighter highlights, so a little bit of kind of weathering on them and things like that. There's a lot because the robes themselves are quite kind of bland, as robes must be, and yes. it's why I detest them. Large, plain areas, um, 
but no, I'm really enjoying putting them together. Uh, I used a kind of a, an image um, that I was working from, uh, ripped from uh, Fallout 76 there. Good kind of brown looking guy in rags. And I thought, yeah. that, is, that is how I want them looking. So I had that up on my monitor yeah. there and I worked the colour scheme from there. And it's 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 been really deeply fulfilling. Mm, good. So yeah, I like working with um, reference material, especially from other yeah. other mediums, other areas, other other worlds. Um, to help draw inspiration from but I've been working um, still on my Chaos Dwarves actually um, Those Chaos Dwarves yeah some of the 90s big hats um, mm. kicking around for years they've been in my loft and I thought you know what it's about time they got some love so yeah I've been working on some of those I've put together a few blunderbuss guys um, I've put together a few goblin um, little grubbly slaves that they kick around with and yeah. uh, um, currently working on a few axemen so they're they're coming together piecemeal slow slowly slowly but again the paint to brush is really helping that helping yeah. that process you know that little tiny bit every day and it literally as i said earlier for me has been on the odd occasion a single highlight on a weapon edge and that's it okay that's what i've got time for today but i always find the time it, it takes me longer to set up <laughs> and yeah prepare than it does for me to actually apply any paint but that's that's just the way it goes isn't it at least it's progress progress is it is it is sometimes but that is progress that mm. little highlight every day eventually you've got a single cow's dwarf's hat highlighted you know? so that's half the model isn't it really? <laughs> which yeah yeah which for a lot of other models that's that's a finished guy you know those those yeah. are big hats so that is this been has been this week's um miniature painting um, yeah. i've been writing up some uh, dungeons and dragons uh, for a game i'm going to be starting soon with some brand new players that's that would be, that's been nice interesting too. yeah um, so trying to keep things balanced and simple and just, uh, you know, how you tailor your game for a brand new player is quite, um, an quite interesting a challenge. Yeah. It, it brings its own challenges, of course. So, um, you know, playing with experienced players also is challenging in a different way, isn't it? You, know, mm -hmm. you have to try and break down those boundaries and those walls that have been built up by experienced players. Yeah. You know, yeah. give them something fresh and exciting. But with a new player, it's like a blank, blank canvas. But you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to underdo it. You want to make it just right to get their first game something that they're going to remember, which is the idea really. So it'd probably just be a one shot, but we'll see how it yeah. goes. Yeah. Yeah. There is, there is that kind of thing. I think maybe, uh, uh, we've all had kind of situations where you've invited maybe one or two, or maybe even a full group, as you say, of yeah. new players into a game that you are super familiar with. Um, and it, it's really enjoyable to make them comfortable in that game and to make sure they have a good experience um and it's really important too because that's that's what will keep them coming back and that's what will get you know if they're not into the hobby themselves yet or maybe they are but in different areas you want to show off what you're doing um in the best possible light and and yeah. sort of tailor it a little bit to to their experience level with playing that's right. Yeah, I think open lines of communication throughout the uh, the, the the whole process is is vital. You know, knowing knowing the player is is quite important to an extent. Mm -hmm. It allows yeah. you to be able to mould it a little bit. That's going to hook them in, create those little story hooks that you know that that particular yeah. person is going to love and going to going to mm -hmm. enjoy. But of course, for some uh, professional GMs that I've had the pleasure of knowing over the years, who just will literally tote yeah. their services to whatever table is going, don't know these players and have never met these players before. So having this good story uh, already cooked up that anybody can jump in who's at any level is quite impressive actually i think that's yeah. a really clever thing to be able to do um so i've got the luxury of knowing these people quite well so yeah that should be should be good fun very yeah, good so you, so you've got some fine things in store for these poor folks oh yes yes many yeah. ways for them to meet their terrible demise <laughs> within the first hour imagine <laughs> absolutely you know, TPK, TPK at the first encounter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That won't be the case because you're a nice GM, life. aren't you? You know, that's that's not what happens. But um, moving on to our discussion for the uh, for the session. Um, yes, let's attempt something like that. I was thinking about um, my I I idea of um, we've touched on it a little bit actually, talking about the things that we've been doing, the things we're enjoying, mm -hmm. um, and talking about drawing inspiration from um, uh, source materials sources, and things when you're yeah. making the idea of there being a Venn diagram of, of hobby life, if you like, 
Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, all these these circles that represent separate hobbies that intersect in different ways um, and that make up the, the person's hobby psyche. Well, Does that make sense? The hobby world, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's quite an interesting interesting thing and an interesting idea is that the all the experiences that I have in all the different hobbies that I've had, the, the books I've read, the comics I've read, um, the, the video games I've played, um, the role play games I've um, been a part of, miniatures I've painted, you know, all these these different facets linked together to make to make you know my hobby experience is quite interesting. You know, they, I'm, I'm able to draw on many many different influences, and not many people really I don't think realise how much they draw on inspiration from other things like that. What do you make of yeah. that? Yeah, I think that's a good point actually. Um, that it's it's probably something that if you sat down you can probably pluck a hobbyist at random uh, in, in probably any sort of hobby field actually but we're talking about the ones that we know intimately this particular one right um but i think you can probably you could you could pick a seasoned veteran and ask them these sort of questions what sort of hobbies do you think um uh, that you have and enjoy intersect with each other and where do you get that kind of crossover kind of value coming in mm. um uh, you could probably do the same thing with people who are really new to any of these sort of hobbies whether it's um whether it's your tabletop gaming or your collectible card games um uh, your reading of your fancy books and watching of the media there and, and playing games and all that sort of stuff um even someone who's fairly new into it it, it would kind of feel strange, I think, if someone, say you knew uh, someone who played, I don't know, like Warhammer 40,000 there. Um, it would be odd, I think, to find that they had never watched um, an episode of Star Trek or Star Wars or something kind of sci-fi, or they didn't have yeah. an interest in playing interest in these games or playing this, this and this. So I think yeah. I think a lot of us do our kind of hobbies um, uh, overlap each other and create those Venn diagrams, as you say. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I think it's interesting if you were to try and make your own one, what what you'd what you'd end up seeing on there. Um, exactly what I've just been uh, you know doing. for me it's like uh, you know if I put down my my comic books that um, not not just the comic books I enjoy so 2000 mm -hmm. AD 2000 AD stuff you know Judge Dredd you know Strontium Dog that that sort of stuff good, yeah. real fun good to real gritty um, you know comic book work um, that unbeknownst to me I suppose up to a point influences my decision of what war games to play you know so i do prefer the necromunda i do prefer playing the the more skirmish based games where i can really get to know the characters individually rather more than narrative and character certain, driven as you say certainly yeah yeah but also when it comes to painting miniatures if i'm, if I'm doing a large-scale army like warhammer fantasy battle for example mm. like the chaos dwarves for instance um trying to choose a color scheme I might be looking at um, a recent video game I played. Oh, look at this recent skin I just managed to win from this game. Like Heroes yeah. of the Storm, for example, is a fantastic a good one. Us, skin. Yeah, looking at the color combinations that these people have put together and thinking that would really work for this thing or for that thing. Or, you know, you do a lot of artwork. So, like, I do. A what, bit. Do you, what do you think? Like, I think got... it's. I think it's definitely that. Um, so I've I've certainly drawn inspiration from. Uh, from from sort of overlapping kind of media interests and things like that there um but that kind of cross pollination goes both ways because there have been there have been times so sort of saying my recent um uh, necromunda bods there their whole color scheme is taken from a single image from from fallout 76 but there have been times where i've ended up painting a selection of miniatures there and just going at it to make a kind of a cool and interesting look, you know, some, yeah. some bright colours and some some like nice detailed airbrushing or whatever. Um, and then I've looked at those and I thought, hang on a second, like, I reckon I could achieve this on a flat piece of paper. And then I've gone at it and it's appeared as something completely different. But yeah. there's, there is a sort of, um, uh, there is kind of a, a uh, sort of a practical kinship in those overlapping of hobbies. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 
the same thing true if you're if if you're reading if you're reading a book or a graphic novel or, or your comics or whatever. Um, sometimes the 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 imagery or the the word craft there is so strong that it conjures these images in your head, you know, and and they are and they're kind of given for you to to then press out upon your miniatures or your yeah. character in a game, you know, equipping them and arming clothing them we all like to dress up our little you know virtual dolls don't we so there we go yeah exactly i think it um i mean it could be argued that all of your experiences in life feed into all of your decisions in life right um but i think it's a bit more specific when we're talking about the hobby influences that we have because I agree. We, can't, yeah. we can't apply all of our like real life experiences into <laughs> our into our hobbies you know it's we can't why not well i don't know why not maybe, maybe we can but um you know for example we can't take our i agree can we take our experiences in buying houses mm. into into our tabletop war gaming not really because we use that to escape all that business right so I did, I did, we lock yeah. ourselves away in this in the, in our venn diagram of hobby you know yeah. to to escape all that and we that's that's where we can really feed off of all of our influences right it's it's yeah it's a beautiful safety net it is. It's it's a, it's a it's a wonderful uh, kind of str- well. I was going to say stress free, but that's not actually the case, is it? Not they, really. They, it has its own little stresses in there. Yeah, but they're they're yeah, kind of enjoyable and accepted ones, aren't they? You know, to an extent, I suppose they are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're talking about stresses and pressures you put on yourself to get some of your jobs done you know and it almost becomes like jobs doesn't it when you think about it you know you think, oh, a job to do i've got to get all my stuff done or get this this skirmish gang painted up for next yeah. week's game oh, you know it's it can it can become a little bit of a, a job and a bit of a stress but it's one of those i wouldn't be doing it if i didn't enjoy it absolutely cause, yeah yeah because yeah. yeah. at the end of it you can you can put that paintbrush down or you can close that book or you can finish up your last game of Heroes of the Storm, the the tenth loss in a row, and oh, you can say, <laughs> you can say, I'm not going to do this for the rest of the evening. I think I'll go and paint some miniatures instead. You know? yeah, so so, bounce from one to the other, and this is the thing, yeah. isn't it? This is, I think this is what ultimately got me thinking about this this whole idea because it's like a constant juggling act, isn't it? It's um, yeah. it's when you've got so many hobbies. It's difficult to keep track. I mean, people will tell me, um, they're, oh, I got so bored last week. Oh, I'm so bored during lockdown. Or, you know, it's like, well, how can you be bored? <laughs> I've got too much stuff to do to be bored. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I can't be... Um, Which is a blessing, right? Yeah, oh, of course, absolutely, yeah. And, and it is a blessing because I'm fortunate to have so many cool people that I know and so many cool things around me that keeps me entertained. Um, and if that if that happens to be video games one day, happens to be miniature war game the next day, happens to get a game of Magic the Gathering the day after that, it's more more's the better. But it does become yeah. a bit of a juggle, and as you said, it can put a little bit of stress on things to think, oh, I really need to get around to doing that, but I've got so many other cool things I want to do. How do I choose? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do I choose? Well, it's roll of dice, isn't it? That's the order of the day. Of course, yeah. When in doubt, let the dice decide. Exactly. Throw that down. I mean, the, the, the same can be applied to, you know, you're buying of a house and whatnot. So that's cool. Just just do it like that. Roll the dice, eh? <laughs> one, two, one, two or three, it's this. You stand in front of your estate agent and just, oh, I'll just roll this dice. What are you doing? Just determining whether or not I'm going to I'm gonna buy this place. <laughs> I mean, they look at you with, with sheer horror. And maybe a little bit of respect. Maybe, maybe a great <laughs> deal of respect. Yes. <laughs> I reckon so. Anyone who's willing to pop the dice out in a real life situation. Yeah. I think, you know, yeah. They, they've got some sand, haven't they? I always keep a portable dice tray in your pocket. Well, I think that's something that all of our listeners maybe might like to take up as well. You mm-hmm. heard it here first, a portable dice tray in yeah. one's pocket. That's it. Make, make it. make a roll for every decision in life. And let fate decide. It. Imagine it. So that was my my ideas for the you know the the Venn diagram. Anyway, it was kind of a um a, a flight of fancy in my own mind of uh, yeah. how how do all these things link up? And the only way I would think of it was oh, they, they they just all intersect quite neatly, you know. Yeah, they really do as well. They really do. And and we kind of I, I think we we absorb all these hobbies and then we balance it as we like, don't we? Mm. You've had times yourself. Uh, I think we all have 
when we've got multiple hobbies on the go, where one waxes and one wanes, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, there's we, been times when I've gone off the boil for uh, Dungeons and Dragons for a yeah. year or two at a time and not not really looked at it very much, but the books are always there on the shelf. That's right. You know, They're always there, yeah. shining on the shelf, ready to That's welcome it. you back. You know, or, or it's the case that you find yourself suddenly hell bent on throwing out a nice big like decent sized army um, and then almost every other hobby has to take a kind of a a, a sideline yeah it takes the back seat to, to that particular type yeah. of project for sure yeah. mm. that's right yeah yeah or and sometimes you want to go out and you know throw around some plastic swords with your friends rubber Very latex laughing. ones you know yeah exactly yeah yeah Put many, on a a road. <laughs> many a time have we uh, locked swords on the field of battle, eh? Exactly. <laughs> on 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 the, the field of a uh, village green. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is which, which is the nearest know, nearest thing we could get. It's a sort of battle. Frightening the locals. That's right. Oh, they love it really. It's <laughs> fine. It's fine. And summer comes around, that's it. They know the boys are gonna be out playing on the field. That's with right. Their, with their rubber lithic swords. Yeah. When summer comes, <laughs> so so one of the things that, that we've um, we've both kind of indulged in over our hobby lives um, would be a spot of a um, magic gathering, mm. playing and collecting. Yeah, playing, collecting, trading, all yeah. of that sort of business. Um, so something that we kind of figured out that we'd like to uh, discuss on this podcast here is um, uh, each issue of the the preamble there uh we're going to select a single card aren't we it's the idea yeah yeah a single a single card chosen um for us by um friends family listeners um yeah. you know exactly um or viewers as as you may be doing yeah. right now um to um i guess just have a look at really and give our thoughts on um the card itself is made up of um, artwork, text, rule, game rules. If you're not familiar with the Magic the Gathering card, we'll show one. Um, are we going to show one now? Maybe we'll show one now. What do you think? I think we will. I think All we'll right. show one now. Um, and, 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 and those of you that are, uh, are not familiar with the game, um, you might have seen uh, similar looking things or you might have seen uh, such things in other game systems as well. Um, but the, the amount of cards it, it created for Magic the Gathering spans... The tens of thousands, isn't it? Tens of thousands, right. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember seeing my first Magic the Gathering card in, like, 94. Um, and, and they've continued to release sets at a phenomenal, blistering pace. Oh, yeah. Um, ever yeah. since. So there's a lot to choose from. I'm hoping we can get through them all. Oh, there's a large pool. Yeah, we've got that many episodes of goodness me. That'd be great fun. Um, well, should this podcast live on after we are gone, then maybe that will happen. But Well, our children will have to take up this mantle. They will uh, indeed. And I, and I for one, am, am a very sad at that notion. <laughs> Here, my legacy to you. Yeah. <laughs> this, what, this. You, what you need to do is talk about a little card each and every week. Um, and that will make that make my spirit happy. There we are. So the one we've chosen today is the, um, as you see, the Adderstaff Boggart or Boggart. Adderstaff Boggart. It's a goblin. Um, I actually built a goblin deck for Magic the Gathering after I built an Orcs and Goblins army for Warhammer. There I was go. very Can much in the goblin again? zone, yeah. you know, and, and it was uh, it was actually quite good. Um, at the yeah. time it was uh yeah at the time there were some very powerful goblin cards in the mm -hmm. most recent magic set that had come out and that particular deck was quite good but this chap um we'll put him onto the big screen here so you can see that. yeah let's throw him up and um well what do you make of him what do i make of him uh, i mean he he looks he looks fairly a, a classic goblin you know small green diminutive sort of somewhere in a mix between um, sort of happy and evil. Um, Looks yeah. like he's enjoying himself. He's having he? a lovely time. He's got a little, he got a little snake wrapped around his staff. He's out of there. Um, it, it's like it's quite a cool piece of artwork. It could definitely slot into 
any sort of um, uh, uh, any sort of book depicting goblins, he he would slot in, and you'd know what that is, wouldn't you? Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of the um, old style fantasy artwork you'd find on the front of Conan books. Yeah, or a fighting um, fantasy or something or, like that. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. does because it's kind of that um, tribal look that can fit in with um, yes. with any kind of fantasy trope, doesn't it? Um, Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this the artist that's, is like Jeff, uh, Mir Jeff. Jeff Miracola. Yeah, yeah, if I pronounce that right, I'm happy. If I haven't, then I'm sorry. Um, Jeff Miracola. And this is from the Lawwind block, isn't it? That's uh, right, yeah. Nine, yeah. Uh, 2000, 2007. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, that was that was a time sort of before Magic had become huge. Um, this, this particular set, actually, the game itself dipped off a little bit and there weren't many players kicking around. Um, during this sort of period of time. Um, so they were a little bit, I think, um, fast and loose with a lot of their game design, um, but also okay. tried to capture the hearts of more people. So the Lawwind block was kind of high fantasy, uh, almost fairy yeah. tale. Um, yeah, it was quite good. So these goblins are sort of seen to be sort of mischievous and, you know, a little bit more yeah. playful perhaps, uh, but still quite vicious. Um, yeah, I can't quite tell if that snake wrapped around his staff is alive or not. I think it might. I be. think so. <laughs> I, I I I take it from the fact that it's strapped there, um, and the fact that there's saliva um, still dripping. Ugh, still yeah, dripping in his mouth. I think that's alive. I think he just waggles that towards people. Um, it looks like he's done something or cast some sort of spell, doesn't it? With that green sort of mist coming around. Mm, Is he broken I, through a wall or something? Is that what I'm looking I, at? I I I kind of. To me, that looks just like a sort of a, uh, 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 a little bit of a lighting effect. Personally, for me, I look at him and I think this this is a goblin who, uh, in the, the sort of true ways of a, uh, a goblin mystic, the fact that he's equipped himself with a staff, but and he's got his little skull hat on there, uh, some oh, yeah. jang jangly bits and pieces, um, he probably can't do any magic. I think he, he, he waves that adder. Pretending you can, hoping for it to bite. Yeah. All the other goblins thinks he thinks he's incredible, but it's actually the adder that does all the work. Is that what it is? I think so. <laughs> I think so. So it's really interesting that you should mention the, um, the the fact that they they had a sort of almost a a kind of a, a fairy tale kind of um, sort of vibe to this um, uh, particular set in that way. Uh, because the the boggart is is a creature from from old lore, isn't it? Mm, that's right. Um, yeah. And and as you rightly pointed out, the characteristics of his face and stuff that they are kind of more mischievous than malevolent. That's it. Yeah. But they do a bit of that as well. I think they do. They like to think they do. Mm. And this uh, and and you were saying they were kind of introducing some new mechanics and they were a little bit loose and free with them maybe. Um, yeah, this player, this one's got the clash mechanic. Clash. Yeah. Mm. So what it's. Do you, wait, how how do you how do you think that? The mechanic <laughs> what, itself. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I think it's fun. It's one of the, it, it, it. It sort of typifies the goblin more than anything. I mean, it's one thing to say it's a, a red mechanic because this is obviously a red card, which yes. is designed to be. Uh, fast, Chance. hard hitting, passionate, you know, exciting, and and yeah, and a lot of it can be down to chance. But mm -hmm. goblins being the way they are, especially in Magic the Gathering, and more so in this particular block, the Lauren block, mm -hmm. um, they are a little bit. Let's just take a chance on this. So it's things like flipping a coin, rolling a dice, or clashing with a player. So it kind of gives you yeah. that. You're sort of hoping that the top card of your deck is a more expensive card as far as the mana cost goes than your opponents. You just have to turn over yeah. the top card and see. So you can build a deck around this sort of thing with the clash mechanic in mind where you are able to stack the top section of your deck to yeah. make it more you make see yourself that, yeah. more likely to win. Um, generally speaking, cards in red don't have that many mechanics. So this guy, if you're building around a sort of clash mechanic, you'd need to sort of stray into a secondary colour to perhaps get that to work you know really well but no it's quite yeah. fun you know um he only becomes more powerful himself as a result of winning said clash so it's quite a selfish mechanic you know so he you clash with the opponent and he grows stronger 
Um, yeah. It's almost like the more the more he rolls the dice and wins, the better he becomes. The more esteem he's been given by his clan of other goblins, perhaps that's what it's supposed to there represent. Go, yeah, maybe yeah. I, um, yeah, I like that. to uh, yeah. When I'm thinking about these mechanics and I'm reading the rules on the card, I still like to give it a a bit of a narrative to the card's yeah. artwork um, that the artist that yeah, Jeff definitely. has tried to portray. Um, so yeah, that, that sort of so it, this sort of mechanic does typify the goblins. Uh, and it typifies the red color as well. So I think it's well designed in the, in a way. Um, it's quite cheap mana cost wise. Only two, only two mana, but then goblins are quite cheap creatures anyway. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I think the card's quite fun. I think the um, suggestion of doing this particular art piece is, was quite a good one. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Um, I think it's it's really interesting that it, it does, as we've mentioned, it harkens back to maybe an older style of fantasy artwork. Mm. Um, you still see things of the modern age produced looking like that, but it is more reminiscent of the uh, the, the sort of the late eighties there, stretching through the years of the nineties, isn't it? Yeah. That kind of look, I think. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And the art direction given to to, to this particular set was, I think, quite specific with that because uh, in the early days yeah, of Magic, I, I do yeah. think that the art direction was a um, a little bit more free. It was like we need some cards quick. Can you can we get as many artists on board to make all these, you know, two or three hundred cards, which at the time would have been an insane amount of work to do. Um, yeah, definitely. But as they've gone on and each set's been brought out, it's been given its own flavor and its own its own art direction. So I think that the Lawwin block is is quite easy to pick out a Lawwin card from amongst other cards because of that quite specific art direction they they were given. Um, and I think old Jeff here does a good job with that. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a really nice looking piece. Um, I like the way, as you described, I like the way you can kind of, if you're of a mind to, you can kind of work that little guy's backstory, can't you? Yeah, I like you, to do that. Look yeah. at his mechanics, mm. and, and you look at the picture. You're you're given kind of everything you need to know um, to make a story for this individual guy. That's it. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's so many ways of playing magic and I have known people to sort of, you know, create stories for their, for their decks and they, they don't stray decks. from them. Yeah. You know, they create a theme for their, for their own decks and, you know, say, Oh, my, my elf deck here, these, these are from a different forest. You know, it's just, you know, it helps them get into the game and get into the spirit of the game, which I think is just as important as you know the mechanics of the game for me is, I think. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's that's another thing that can that can uh, you can often find players doing in a lot of these sort of games. Yeah. You will find people that are that are really hardcore into the mechanics um, and who enjoy the game through that um, that particular vein. Um, that they're going to be playing to win. Uh, I mean, everyone's playing to win, but yeah. but sometimes you're you're you're. So you're building your magic deck, or you're composing your um, your miniatures army. Um, some people will will go more about. I just want to make it as powerful and as clean winning as possible. Some people will do almost the polar opposite and go. I just want this thematically cool. Yeah, like, that's right. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna take. It, it doesn't matter that these cards are terrible. It's like. You in a goblin army, the majority of your guys are going to be goblins. If yeah. if that's the kind of theme that you're running, so you're ex you expect heavy happy. losses, whatever happens, and half exactly. of the losses will be self inflicted, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, which is what we all love about goblins. So yeah, so let's get rid of that picture off the screen there. So yeah, let's apologies to our apologies to our audio listeners. So hopefully, our little discussion there about the um, the goblin was enough to wet your whistle. Give you some yes. good little info. Yeah, the Adder Staff Boggart. I think you should all go and look it up. And look it up, look yes. At, have a look at his grinning little face. Thank Jeff for what he did there. <laughs> and, um, you know, yeah, if, credit if, where credit's due. Good job, Jeff. If, yeah, exactly. Nicely done, Jeff. Very good. So, so I think oh. we, we're going to do that with a card um, selected by someone or other, aren't we, each time we do one of these? Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll leave all our contact information on the uh the show notes and and things like that so it's all uh, easy to get get in touch with us if you've got an idea um but yeah let's um move on to our next section i guess which is probably saying our farewells is it not 
I think so. I think uh, uh, time has elapsed here. It perhaps has. Where can people find us? I suppose people are going to know if they want to get in touch with us, they want to know how to. So we've got some information down here, down there, etc. Um, with how to uh, how to con contact us and get in get in touch with us. If you want to um, uh, pick up the magic card that we discussed, um, you know you can check check out some of our social medias. Um, any any anything you want to add to that there, Grumsworth? Um, I think it's the case there that I think you've tidied up very nicely there, Burlock. Um, all the information, links and whatnot will be provided in the description of this as well. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's I think that's almost a kind of a uh, a wrap for zero. It is, isn't it? Yes. Um, was there a book quote? Oh, oh. You need to keep that as a secret. Like, right. the, do you know the only quote that springs to my mind? is one that I've sworn like never to utter right because it is a single line from an incredible series of books um and 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 the line is is breathtaking it is the one of the most incredible pieces of writing I have ever like ever read and whenever anyone asks for a book quote or anything like that that line pops in to my head and then I uh, no but what I do suggest, right, if you want to find that line, right, <laughs> and you might know what you might, you might read these books and completely get it. Um, it is uh, a set of books called The Stone Dance of the Chameleon by Ricardo Pinto. And for my money, they are the best fantasy books world building wise outside of Tolkien. They, they are absolutely incredible uh, and the man himself actually has just started to reissue um uh that particular story in new compacted slim volumes which he's given a little bit of a rewrite um which i'm currently reading right now and they oh, are incredible uh, he also has a superb website um where you can log into and basically explore the world that he has crafted. It is his life's work. And who was it? What was really his name? Pinto, was it? Yeah, Ricardo Pinto. Ricardo Pinto. Very good. Right. Well, on that fantastic note, let's uh, say farewell to you all. Rumsworth, it's been a pleasure. It is always a pleasure, Burlock. Um, and uh, I think we have to give the old traditional send off. All oh. shall suffer. All, all we shall suffer, in the words of Leoric. <laughs> all shall suffer. Right, farewell. Until Very next good. time. Goodbye, everyone. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to The Preamble. Be sure to check us out on Switch, Spotify, or find us on Player FM. And if you want to get in touch with us, send an email to thepreamble at gmail.com. Your hosts were Grumsworth and Burlock. Brought to you by roguesgaming.com. Special thanks to our contributors, our showcase artist, and of course, to all of you. See you next time.